Uh, this is the Build OGM call for Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. Our topic is WWOD, or what would OGM do? Um, and thank you for, for being here. Uh, I, I thought I'd like wander into the topic for a little bit and then stop and see where, if that resonates and, and how to build on that and so forth. And I think the way I'll do it is, um, let me put a link uh, in the chat. Oh, actually, um, I'll put a link into the Zoom chat here just for everybody. And then uh, let's use the, I renamed the stewards channel on Mattermost to, uh, to be build OGM. So now we've got a channel there. Uh, let's use that as our persistent chat for this call. So I'm flipping around my display. Oops, I should have not done that because I'm about to share my display. So let me hit undo on that. Uh, uh, darn it. Okay, let me exit full screen, exit full screen on the Zoom. I just screwed myself up. There we go. All right, let me go back to normal things so I can screen share because I was building out what would OGM do in my brain? And it seems like an easy way to start this conversation is to step into that. Um, and, and maybe I, um, I should offer a little just preamble to that to, um, to set the stage. Um, we've been meeting for 16 months or something like that and zooming along doing stuff. We are still squishy like, gel, like a jellyfish uh, and uh, have a few moving parts, sort of, and we have some understanding. And we and we've developed an idea of things being maybe OGME, but I think that we have a very uh, like disparate idea of what OGME is and what OGME should be doing. And one of the interesting things that OGM I think can can do and is headed toward doing is being helpful to other organizations and sort of being of use to them, and in so doing, sort of uh, sharing membership. Uh, and, and building ideas and building community over time. Uh, and in order to outreach, we kind of need to know what do we offer and how do we work and what does it mean? And like, wait, what are the steps and what, what goes where? So this conversation is a way to start uh, painting that picture and understanding our dynamics and putting words to it and maybe creating some media that explain it. I think that would be really interesting and useful. I'm busy trying to explain OGM to potential people to fund fellowships for OGM. Uh, so this is extremely useful in, in my thinking on that. Uh, so that's one of the one of the reasons here. Um, Phil has just put a HackMD link in the Zoom chat, and I'm thinking also uh, there we go. And there, and Pete put the same link in the Mattermost chat. So let's use that. And with that, let me share my screen and go to my brain where I was puttering around on this topic uh, to talk through, to just sort of talk out loud through what I'm thinking, uh, what would OGM do? And um, can everybody see this? We yes. Did? Okay, great. Um, and so this is of course a kind of a parody of what would Jesus do? And as, as, as it would happen, here's Jesus Christ, decision-making models. Uh, and then I've collected others. What would Google do? What would better look like? Uh, what would Kanye do? It was a thing for a while. Uh, what would John Wayne do somehow? What would the internet do as a thing? So anyway, uh, back to what would OGM do? Um, and then I started building out, and this is a link for today's call, which, which is where I'll take notes kind of in, in the brain way that I do during our calls. Uh, but then I started putting down, okay, so um, I think, and uh, allow me to just sort of talk through this because I'm trying to paint what I think this is, and I think I've missed a bunch of stuff, and I may be saying things that you don't think we do, and all of that. So uh, please note all those things, and let's when I when I stop this kind of initial uh, brushstroke work, uh, we'll we'll have that conversation. So I think one thing we do is we bridge high functioning entities that are working on all parts of collective intelligence, and that presupposes some idea of collective intelligence and what we mean by it, which I'm going to link to now. Um, so uh, that kind of says, well, we, we have some knowledge of what collective intelligence means or is, uh, which uh, is a conversation we can have. Same thing for collaborative sense-making. And I'm not sure that collective intelligence and collaborative sense-making are, uh, are equivalent and are the best terms for all of this. There may be a collective wisdom, maybe a different way, because uh, I'm not crazy about the word intelligence. And although 
there are many different kinds of intelligence and they, it includes emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence and stuff like that now. So maybe it's okay, but, but bridging entities means um, being a connector that tries to help movements link arms and be more than they're doing individually. And in so doing, uh, kind of to crystallize movements, motion, energy in the world without trying to homogenize the movements. So I, when I say bridge the high functioning entities, I don't mean that OGM is going to become a roll up where we buy all these nonprofits that are doing good work and try to turn them into one thing or one, you know, uh, one collective intelligence, but, but rather that there's like a hive mind that we can help uh, produce here. And I didn't use the words hive mind anywhere in, in what I'm about to show you, but I, I like hive mind also. Um, bring uh, emotional intelligence to political and other kinds of charged debate. Uh, because one of, the one of the motivations for OGM is that we are in a Mexican standoff worldwide between the forces of the alt-right and other people trying to like fix, you know, face and fix world crises. And part of what's broken is this trust gap. And I'm just realizing that I really didn't address uh, trust anywhere in the things I'm about to show you. So I think, uh, I think trust uh, could use, a, could use a, a showing in here. Um, uh, help wise initiatives. So uh, as we bridge these high functioning uh, entities, let's help wise initiatives connect and amplify their own reach. So there's this, there's this kind of, uh, and I'll connect this to the, to the bridging function because I think they're, they're related, but um, how, so plan B is out there. So game B is out there trying to figure things out. And uh, theory U has already got a whole lot of work on the ground. And you know, there's, there's some entities that are way far ahead of us. Um, how do we help them um, amplify their reach, connect to others, which is, I guess I'm duplicating here the bridging notion, but how do we help everybody sort of move together? Um, uh, honor and increase diversity in all that we affect. Basically, uh, understand that if we build a platonic, Socratic, logical model that perfectly explains the world, we have managed to take like the white people's history and uh, represent only what that is, and ignore the fact that that like Plato and Aristotle are not the peak of of logic and reason to uh, a whole bunch of people on earth. To take one slice at, at what that might mean, uh, but to be really uh, to, to to understand and be extremely permeable to uh, diversity of points of view, uh, where this danger lurks that is also not represented here in OGM because uh, there's, there's a fight worldwide over the, the scripts in our heads. And I think, we're, I think part of what we can do is play an important role there. Uh, now, I've also uh, connected this thought to other uh, thoughts that I had done earlier, which is early OGM design questions. So what kind of biz or organizational structure will let us treat participants well and host for-profit projects? Uh, how do we manage complexity as complexity arises in OGM? Because we've got a really big uh, spectrum of, of topics. They're like, I, I, I'm, I'll be the first to say that OGM is a, a little too big, but, but I think that, that, that the scope of vision is really important here. So, um, so if, you, if you follow the link I sent you, you can go back here and browse through all of these things. Um, I want to get through my list real quick so that I can pause. Uh, so I think we also want to host and uh, host experiments and challenges for the things that matter in OGM. Uh, as part of that, we will present visions of OGM futures, which might be, hey, imagine if this thing existed. And then, okay, how does that exist? Who's already done a piece of it? Bring them into the conversation. Connect up what they built. Um, maybe one, maybe one fruitful way to explain. Um, explain this is a, a thought I've been having recently that um, uh, we are already connected into Pirigaji, which is a community that has, that has built a lot of derived wisdom about how to do crap detection, how to use digital tools well, how to, how to be intelligent and, and sort of uh, communitarian online. We are also already connected to Liberating Structures, um, Nancy White and others uh, who've been part of designing their body of work, which exists as a deck of cards and a pattern language and a website. Uh, and then uh, we also are connected through to Tom Attlee and the wise democracy pattern language. And it struck me that um, one of the things, sort of a piece of low hanging fruit for OGM would be, how do we take those existing bodies of wisdom that other communities of practice have developed, <clears throat> instrument them so that they're really easy to use and at hand for people who are trying to figure out 
how do I make my meeting better? How do I get over this conflict we have <clears throat> in our discussion? How do we, you know, how do we, how do we leave tools and techniques at hand so that they're used all the time? So I think that that, that to me is, uh, lights up my head for, oh, we could kind of do that. Uh, which is uh, the thing I'm saying, I'm trying to say here, which is make wisdom easier to use. <clears throat> so instrument these bodies of wisdom so they are easier to understand and set in motion. Nurture communities of experts in wise processes and bodies of knowledge, which means uh, to create guides, curators, facilitators for hire, for example, for uh, who help make wisdom easier to use. Um, map, share, and connect everything. Uh, I think a, a piece of, of open global mind is about creating the collective mind, uh, the collective brain, the outboard manifestation of what we know, which is sort of uh, a, a more abstract layer above Wikipedia. Wikipedia is cool, but it's an encyclopedia. Uh, it doesn't really make room for individual points of view. It intentionally has a policy called neutral point of view. Um, uh, how might we promote people expressing their particular points of view in a generative way, uh, using whatever tools make sense to them. Uh, in all of this, trying to nurture generative commons, some language that has arisen for us recently, uh, the idea that there's a way of working together where we externalize what we do, we work in public, we create, uh, we put bodies of, of, of what we've figured out into the commons, we, we are busy um, uh, wandering through the commons, trying to improve the things we find and put them to work here so that we don't reduplicate any effort. Uh, sort of curating wisdom in the generative commons is a, maybe a refinement of that. <clears throat> and then uh, pioneer new needed practices for collaborative sense-making. So um, if, there, if we're trying to enhance meetings, events, decisions, uh, conversations, discourse, then in some cases we're going to have to, uh, we, may, we may envision something that sort of doesn't exist yet. So we may need to pioneer this new practice. And here, uh, one of the practices that, that, that uh, is on the table is something called story threading, which is different from graphic facilitation or normal meeting facilitation. And um, we have not yet, but may be able to pioneer story threading for somebody uh, for an event and get paid for it. And I think that would be great. And if it turns out that story threading is really useful and becomes a new practice, then we will have helped invent uh, a new a sort of a new way to help make sense of the world together, which would be great. Um, uh, permit, present, present visions of OGME futures I talked about, promote collaborative sense making, uh, promote idea sex. And this is just sort of a clickbaity kind of way of saying um, a lot of what we're bumping into here is people with ideas. And sometimes the ideas are just in an essay, in a blog post, in a book, in a video or whatever. Um, but how do we download or debrief those ideas so that we can understand, so that we can complexify them and understand what they're connecting to and what they're building on from and all of that. And then how do we compare these narratives productively how do we actually, um, what tools does it take? I'm sitting here curating in the brain, which I happen to be addicted to. Uh, and, and you're looking at one mind map I've been curating for 23 years. Um, Mark Carranza has been curating a very different kind of data structure he calls MX, named after the Memex for, for since 1984, but he's not sharing it out that much. Uh, so how do we get that, that and other people using other tools to be able to interconnect and weave richer stories and connect up sort of the wisdom of the world? Uh, how can individuals manifest their beliefs in, in ways that meld with larger groups' beliefs so that we can preserve the sovereignty and point of view of individuals and then somehow cascade upward into, you know what, whatever, like Pete Kaminsky says, in these domains speaks for me. So I'm sort of signing up for, for his manifestation or publishing of, of how things work and what to do. Um, and then uh, prototype missing pieces that lead to collective intelligence, I, I think I said, and then swap DNA with wise organizations. So as we're busy uh, bridging high functioning entities uh, and all of that, I'll connect that over here as well, um, to pick up the best of what they've figured out. And you know, we're looking for, uh, we're looking for ways to, um, we're looking for ways to reward participants fairly. So um, how, you know, is, is there a pie slice protocol? Uh, Pete men mentioned the pie slice protocol and some other things about how to do that. 
um, somebody else invented the protocol, awesome. If it works really well, how do we A, bring it in? And then how do we instrument it so that it's easily at hand and usable for other organizations? If this is a, if this is a high functioning way to do things, uh, let's do that. And then last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up and see what everybody else thinks. Um, last thing I'll say is something inspired uh, kind of by Jordan Sukut, who's been helping lead us into a, a, a fiscal structure that would help us get some of these things done more formally. Um, which is how do we sort of help each of these entities meet its higher purpose? How do we, how do we help um, people who are sort of struggling out there uh, kind of hit their best and highest purpose in the world? Um, how do we keep our, our, our aim high uh, in, in terms of like where we're headed and what we're trying to get done together uh, to make the world a little bit of a better place? Things like that. Um, so, um, I'm going to hit pause and see who'd like to jump in. And I'll note that we're all white guys on the call. Just, um, uh, we need to fix this, but I'm not going to let that stop this conversation because a piece of what we can fix here is one of those issues as well. Scott, please. Um, I'll try not to take up too much time here, but the reason I'm back is because oh. of that very thing that you just said. And the inherent problem that I'm seeing is a question, I, I've been thinking about this deeply. And so I could be wrong, but I'm, I wanna throw this out there. I think that there's an assumption that because it's a bunch of white guys by appearance, that that means that it's not a diverse group. And that deeply concerns me. And it concerns me because there are assumptions being made that, I, I don't know, so let, me, let me ask a question. I'll skip through a bunch of my other stuff that I had written up, but here's, here's my fundamental question. And I had heard this recently and I thought it was really, I don't know, I thought it was important. Is there more variation within groups or between groups? So the idea is, is there more variation within a group of white guys on a screen or between groups, meaning this group has fundamental things that are different from a group that looks very different from us? And I think the question is important because what I heard two weeks ago was that there's fundamentally different more difference between groups, which is why you need people who look different. And what I'm wondering is, well, if the range of possible attributes is actually broader within any group than it is between two groups, what struck me as problematic and something that I haven't heard is isn't the fundamental racist idea that there's two groups of people that are overlapping in such a small way based on one attribute, what they look like, their race, their sex, their whatever, their age, whatever it happens to be. The idea that, that if, the if the main difference is between groups as opposed to here we have a group of people who, I mean, if we were to write down our attributes, would we all be the same? I, I highly doubt it. I think we would be actually much more diverse than we think. And I'm not saying that, that there's any, that I'm welcoming everyone. Obviously, my fundamental proposition is I believe in the inherent sovereignty, agency, and value of every individual. And we would never suggest that we could speak on behalf of another person, which, I mean, it's one of the reasons we have power of attorney. You can never say, you can't talk for another person. And so it just, I don't know, it's just something I've been thinking about, like this assumption that, that there's more diversity between groups than there is within groups and it's actually diversity of attributes 
that that you're looking for across individuals across from from everywhere instead of we need one from this group because if we just get one from that group that represents everybody from that group which i think is total bullshit you know i just think it's a it's a flawed model that that actually increases the problems that we're having because it makes it stereotypical that well we we need one from here and one from here and one from here because if we have one that means that we've represented and i don't think that's true at all so as you as you i don't know what you said to kick me off on that jerry but that mm -hmm. was that was something that has been weighing heavy on me for the last couple of weeks after some of the comments about well we can't make it written because then we exclude people of color who have an oral tradition and i thought wait a minute interesting i wonder how they they see see that's even that's even saying a group what about an individual who's here what would they say would they say oh i agree with you you need to 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 make it verbal because i don't i, I like that just seems wrong to me that thanks we're, Scott. That we're, i don't know so, so okay i'm um i'm I, done I, I, I think you, I think you've um, put uh, the idea on the table well, and I just I want to turn to Mark Antoine and Pete uh, for their their thoughts. And Mark Antoine, you may uh, you may have raised your hand before and not be on this topic, so I I'd like to stay on Scott's question for a second uh, before we turn to other things. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have both things to say uh, about Scott's point and what you raised earlier. So um, I think that. I absolutely agree with the point that if we have a quote unquote token representative of another group, they don't speak for that group. Uh, the notion of representativity is very difficult to understand. And yes, individual variation trumps group variation, but group variation still exists. And I think you do gain more diversity as a rule if you have a visibly diverse community. And I think for me, the most important aspect is there are such things as traditional positions of power. And uh, the most insightful uh, people I find are those who have been in situation of being in a minority, being invisible, being powerless. They understand power better than those who are in power. And uh, people who come from groups that are as a whole, <laughs> Uh, disadvantage in power relations uh, gives a perspective that is not given otherwise. That, that doesn't mean that we individually may not have been powerless, but that's the systemic aspect of it gives another perspective. So that's what I have to say about that. Can I go on on something else or do you want to go? Let more? me come, let me come back to you for the other okay. stuff because I'd like to, I'd like to focus on the I do questions. have to leave at the hour, but otherwise, sure. Say bien. I'll come, I'll be back, back to you. Pete then Hank. You're still muted on the Zoom. Dang it. Damn it. Uh, when it's early in the morning, clicking it's, two it's, things is apparently it's too hard. It's, it's the unraising hand and the unmuting, yeah. Um, uh, first, first of all, Scott, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having a perspective and, and for just saying it. Um, and, and by the way, I, the, there's, a, there's a thing that you said at the, at the front of what you started to say, which is, I, I, I'll try not to take up too much time. And I think, you know, when you have something important to say, I, it's not about how much time, you know, you take. Uh, uh, so, and uh, Mark Antoine, thanks for, thanks for reminding us about system, uh, systemic, you know, racism or sexism, and also traditional, um, traditional bastions of power and things like that. So that's definitely part of the problem. Um, so especially as white guys, I feel like it's incumbent upon us in our lives and in our work with other people to make sure that we hear from people who traditionally aren't white and men. Um, I, and I and I also kind of want to acknowledge something that I feel like was implicit in what Scott said. Um, uh, 
there's a there's a thing where even noticing what you know what uh, whether somebody's light skinned or dark skinned or noticing whether or not somebody's a woman or a man and actually even presuming that somebody who looks like a man is a man and somebody who looks like a woman is a woman you know all of that all of that is stereotyping and all of that is you know when it when it gets down to that level of of prejudice prejudging somebody by the way that they look you know you're you're pretty far down the path of like like you're you're you have structurally failed at that point when you have to start counting whether or not you've got you know one woman or two women or three women or you know 50 percent women or 70 percent women it's a structural fail at that point so i want to kind of acknowledge that it's sexist to notice whether or not somebody has a gender and what gender they are based on what they look like and it's racist racist as hack to look at somebody and go i judge you by the color of your skin you know that's the definition of racism having said that i know and i feel better when there are more people that look different from me in the room and i know that there are cultural ways of being that each one of us as a white man has not experienced because we're not black because we're not a woman in a man's a white man's world you know so so my you know in this call i'm having a heck of a time staying here because my stomach hurts because i don't want to be in you know it's and it's i love being in a group of all guys and we you know we have the guy jokes and the guy power you know hierarchies and all that stuff i navigate that well because i've done that for you know most of all of my life but it's not very grown up it's not very mature it's and scott i i appreciate that amongst the folks here we have a, a complete completely interesting range of diversity so the problem isn't diversity so when you know that when we telescope the problem down to you know diversity it's not i guess i i don't want to be bean counting i really do not want to be bean counting but there are sets of diversity within this group that we just cannot access and and for the work that we're doing they are some of the most important kinds of diversity power and you know um power dynamics i guess it's mostly power dynamics right white men have most of the power in the world and that's and like it or not guys look at your face and people like this have been screwing the world over for four or five hundred or six hundred years and you know so if we're if we're to make progress on changing the world each of us i'm sure is a lovely person but we need we need more diversity of diversity it's not just you know diversity of color and skin it's diversity of cultural experience diversity of uh, experience of power and so um thanks pete let's go to phil and hank uh, actually, I think Hank was ahead of me. I don't know why I assume. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just thinking about how I saw the hands, but uh, let's go to Hank and Phil. Okay. Uh, this is a terrific conversation. And on all different projects I've been involved in, people are always looking for tokens and a representative of this or that, like uh, Scott was uh, talking about. And in fact, I've often found myself uh, uh, living in, in Europe and being the type of person I am as being seen as the representative of something. And uh, obviously, as everyone has said up until now, that's not what we want. But I did want to bring in uh, one uh, very extensive uh, experience I've had in 25 or 30 years of organizing uh, uh, group uh, conversations and dialogue uh, and that's it's a European experience uh, and it's a, to some extent international experience if there are no women in the group you have conversation A if you have seven men and one woman already the tone changes if you have six men and two women, the tone changes again, etc., etc. And what I mean to say by that 
is, aside from anything else that has to do with feminism, tokenism, sexism, women and men bring in such different neurological cognitive ways of looking at the world. I've experienced it every single time. And I think I've had less experience with generations, but I have had experiences where uh, teenagers and uh, let's say working adults and seniors are in the same conversation. And the conversation is again, very different than if you don't have teenagers or some teenagers. It's, it's a personal experience. Thank you, Hank. Uh, Phil, then me. Um, I just want to say thanks everyone for, for your input and perspective so far. Um, it's a very rich conversation. I just wanted to, to first state, I, I think, I think we're, we're all agreed on this, but the idea of bringing people in for a headcount or a number or a, a token, kind of tokenizing people, is not only doing us a disservice, but doing them a disservice. Bringing someone in to be the one person in the room like them is not a, a path that fosters comfort and, and the ability to, to talk about or maybe share perspective. I think Michael mentioned a couple of times recently that it might be good for us to, to look out to other groups where we might be the one white guy in the room and sit in on conversations and just listen and hear and, and see what topics come up. I'd also like to shift the conversation a bit into not inviting specific people, but what practices are, are we engaged in that are, are, are leading to this kind of the, the homo, homogeneous, homogeneity of our group, sorry. So things like our meeting times, like we're, we're all privileged enough to have this time on a, on a Tuesday to, to sit down and talk for an hour and a half about these topics. Is that inclusive of, of a wide range of people or is that inclusive of, of a certain demographic? Um, we're also, the subjects and topics we talk about are, are very important and necessary topics, but we talk about them because we have the privilege to be able to talk about them when there's other issues that people, that, affect people's lives more day to day that they might want to focus on. So bringing in people and, and introducing new topics, I think um, is an important practice and an important, something we should try and focus on just basically shifting, not inviting specific people, but what practices can we bring in or introduce that might help foster a bit of diversity. Um, thank you, Phil. Uh, I like that, I agree a lot. Uh, so just a couple of thoughts I want to and to this piece of the conversation. One, my favorite quote on this is the privilege of privilege, privilege is not noticing the privilege. So I'm willing to bet that nobody in this Zoom right now has had to cross the street because somebody walking toward them or behind them was like really spooky and they felt they were gonna get beat up or that nobody in this room got turned down or was worried when filling out an application that their name looked funny to the person that they were applying to and had to worry about not getting a loan or not getting a job or not getting a house or whatever else because of any attribute around them <clears throat> that was a marker of difference. I'm willing to bet of you know, 15 different things about the people currently in this room. I also know that I attract pretty left-leaning kind of people and there's probably not any alt-right um, lurkers in OGM. There may be some people who, who are a little on the right, but we probably don't have a lot of QAnon folks and a lot of other sort of people that have a, a really wildly different uh, point of view. And I have to say with some trepidation that I'm interested in and eager to do idea sex with people who have like really different kind of jarringly different points of view about what's happening in the world and why, because I think that those things done well in public would be really useful. And then those people are not in this group because I don't think they'd be attracted to this group. They wouldn't hang out. And nobody like that has sort of uncloaked really uh, in our conversation, in our various conversations. Um, second thing is years ago, and I need to find her again, um, I saw uh, uh, an exhibit by a photographer who had pho photographed cliques around the world. So she went to like London skinheads who'd had like egg white uh, stiff uh, mohawks and, you know, piercings and uh, uh, leather and studs. And then she went to other and she photographed these cliques and the differences across the cliques were astonishing. Like, like, wow, these people really look different because a piece of what made the clique was really looking radically different. And then within clique, the conformity was incredible. So all the skinheads had a, had a chain across the front of their outfit. All the skinheads were like in Doc Martens. Uh, like like the, the, the in, intra group conformity was like surprising once you compared the photos across cliques. 
And I was like, that's really interesting. And I just put that in the conversation as a, as a, as a piece of a, a figure of note, because we all, I think we attract people of good intention who want collective intelligence. And that does something to the structure of our conversations. And as Phil pointed out, the time we meet, the, to have the time to have this conversation, to be interested in an abstract conversation about knowledge at a time when like shit is melting down uh, is, is privilege all by itself. And I, I totally agree with, with, with all of that. Um, then years ago, I heard a talk by Dick Foster, the ex McKinsey partner who wrote a book about the S curve. He sort of said, this is how progress works. And, and I, I was in a small group meeting where he presented what, what appeared to be his, valedic, his valedictory um, speech because he was getting on in years. And, and it, 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 the preamble was, I've been working on this for a really long time. You're the first group I'm saying this to. And he starts with Plato and Aristotle. And I'm like, oh, fuck you. Like that was my inner voice. But, but like he, he's, he's building a logical structure for how, the, how everything in Western, everything in civilization is built on the logic gifted to us by the Greeks. And I'm like, seriously, fuck you because that excludes uh, most of the world actually, like, like the largest portion of population that doesn't see that that's the, the structuring of civilization and all that. And, and, and I think that many of us are trying to, to, we're trying to crack the code. We're trying, like Scott, you've been working really, really hard to build a logical system that people can use that, that uses physical objects as part of a manifestation to understand how things work and therefore how to act better and what to do to fix these things. And I think that most of us here are blind to very different ways of seeing how this works. And the book that cracked this open for me was uh, The Healing Wisdom of Africa by Maladoma Somme and a couple other books that are in my non-white guy canon, which I'll put a link to. And basically Somme is kidnapped from his tribe in West Africa at age five, put into the French school system, which he succeeds in. He barfs out of that, comes back to his village and is like totally turned off by how primitive everything is, goes through a three day initiation process during which he suddenly sees the tree that's in the middle of the group turn into a woman and he runs up and holds her. And he has this deep spiritual experience of having crossed through to the other side. He sort of connects to what everybody else is seeing and talking about in a way that he couldn't because the modernist lens that had been polished and, 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 and you know, installed on his system didn't let him see it. And that, is just, and that was just one peek for me behind the curtain of what a whole lot of other people take for granted, see as their background, see as their, their story. And, and by busy being like logical and coming in with solutions that are gonna work, we're busy foisting other points of view on people who don't actually even see that way or relate that way to one another. And some people preserve the ability to see auras and see, and I don't know, but, but there's a whole lot of other stuff out there that's going on that I think is outside of our normal um, scope of, of operations. And so I find myself um, as a white guy championing other people's points of view as much as I can so when I get a little sniff of one of the things I just mentioned in the air, I will point to it. I'll be like, that is really valuable. That is really good. And then that little ember goes out because the group doesn't turn its attention to it. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we don't really sort of go there and I don't push hard enough. And I haven't done en enough of my own personal work in this sphere to make it matter. And I would love to use Open Global Mind, whatever the hell that is, as we decide through these conversations to figure out where it goes and what that means. So I feel like we're way underrepresented on diversity of different kinds without head counting of people who just merely look different or of other genders. I feel like we're, we're, we're like really missing uh, a, a piece. And, and Phil's question about what is it that we're doing that has us being sort of homogeneous-ish is a really important question. Um, and one of my few amateur answers to that, Phil and others, is to try to go and be of service to other communities that are pretty different from us with what we do. And that's why I'm trying to figure out, wait, well, what do we do? And what do we bring to anybody else? And why are we here? If, and if we can figure that out for ourselves as, this, as whoever showed up, as whoever is in the room, if we can figure that out with the intention of being of service to others who are really different from us, I think that starts to solve some of these sorts of questions in different ways and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. So let me go to Marc Antoine, partly also because you have to leave in, in 15 minutes. Yeah, I'd like to go back to what I wanted to say at first and, <laughs> and, and it was Sounds a bit great. outside of this, but it does relate. Uh, when you were saying who are we and what's our mission and you know and I've 
as I've always interpreted, we're the connectors, right? I was thinking about how, uh, for example, Mika Sifri, this, this saying, you know, what's really important when you do these very diverse movements, like he was working in Occupy, is to have these few clear goals, actionable goals and testable goals. Uh, and in a way, this or Ostrom on there needs to be a boundary about around the um, people who take care of the commons. Uh, there and, and every group creates itself by creating a boundary. Varela, autopoiesis, right? The boundary is what defines the group and what makes it exist. You cannot exist without a boundary. And at the same time, our reason of existence is going across boundaries. And there's a profound paradox there. I don't have the answer to that. I just want to lay that here. And I think it totally fits in with the conversation that we're wondering how to attract people who are not in our position, privileged position, of trying to have perspective and see things from multiple viewpoints and trying to connect across boundaries. And this is, yes, what defines who we are. We are the boundary crossers. And at the same time, we're doing it from a situated viewpoint. I totally agree with that, with all the limits that entails. But we at least try to be the boundary crossers. So how is it to define a group of boundary crossers and can it work as any other group? I don't have the answer to that. I really want us to tackle with that question. Me Art. too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, others on the questions Scott raised, and then let's turn back to, let's let's go back to sort of zero and, and, and the general idea of the question why we're here. Go ahead, Pete. Um, I, I want, I'm not sure exactly how to say this. Uh, the, so in, invite is the wrong, is the wrong framing. Um, I, th I think of something that uh, Lauren actually had a really good rant uh, on the OGM Lionsburg call last Thursday, which I think is probably posted in this, um, in this channel. Um, uh, so Lauren, uh, of course, is part of Kiko Lab. Kiko Lab is, has been pretty good at having a diverse, diverse set of people on their calls. Um, and uh, she kind of tore into the, the white man in the room and said, you know, you all think this is easy work. You all think it's like easy for Kiko Lab. You know, we just throw up a, you know, a flyer and people show up. And that's not what happens. I spend, she, Lauren, I spend a lot of time working with different people, making them feel welcome, you know, working offline, not in the group and in, and not just like inviting people, hey, you, uh, you know, this call is available for you to show up and don't worry, it's going to be a bunch of white guys and that's perfectly fine, right? Um, it's a lot more about getting the right people available and in the room before the call, right? Um, I want to I, I, I want to relate some personal experience um, uh, through the through the Plex, um, the the uh, collective of collectivist collectives that OGM is part of. Um, I've got um, three or four standing calls uh, every week. Um, one on one calls as it happens, they could be, I, I guess I've got, you know, a couple others that are not quite OGM flotilla is one um, flotilla is not particularly diverse either. Um, but my one on one calls, I've been gifted, or blessed or, or whatever. Um, the one on one calls I have, they're all with women, they're all women, every one of them is a woman. Um, two of them out of three or four is are people of color. Uh, one of the one of the black women is from from another country, um, and uh, she was like, "I've got a bunch of ideas, but whenever I say them, uh, people say, oh, 'Oh, you're from uh, another country.' Uh, we don't we don't." She's not talking about us in the calls, but um, you know, she says stuff in her life around her. Um, she lives in New York, and and what she gets back is, "I'm sorry, you're from another country. Your opinions don't count here." And I'm like, "What?" You hear this in the US, you hear this with people that like, you know, it, it's not in a red state. It's like, 
and it just blew my mind that that happens, right? So it's not like there aren't, and, and, and each of these people, it wasn't like I invited them because they were women or it's not because we're cross-cultural that we're, we're together. The, the weird thing is that we have to talk about it once in a while, you know, it's like, oh, I recognize that you're a black woman. And so then you've got this, I, I was, uh, to my black friend, um, I, I heard this, another, an, another person who happens to be black and I'm like, please, I hope you don't think that I'm inviting you because I, you know, because I, because I, I recognize that both of you are black. And so you must have this magical, it's like, I'm sorry, that's, and she's like, Pete, why would you even think that? I know you, I know that you're not that kind of person. I said, well, as a white man, that happens sometimes. It happens that I do something stupid and stereotypically white, even though I try really hard not to, right? And she says, don't worry about it, Pete. It's, I, I, I know that you're not that kind of person. But so it, it's not that we don't have, to, to Scott's point kind of, you know, it, I, you know, I, I didn't invite these people because they were different from me. I invited them because, I, so I get working around back to that. The reason that we're talking, every single one of those people, we're talking because we share common interests. And we happen to be, you know, different colors and different genders and stuff like that. But that's not the, the point, right? So the, the ecosystem we're in has a variety of interesting people. And, and somehow, you know, when we cluster together, um, we, we create these clusters that repel or, or are anti-attendable um, by, you know, by interesting people. And they're right around us. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not like they're different from us. It's not like, so, a personal Thanks, view. Thanks, Pete. I'm Phil. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, yeah, I, I think one, one step, I, I'm trying to just to work towards kind of actionable steps we can take into this week, next week, the following weeks. One thing in terms of also Mark Antoine's point, maybe we ident identify thinkers um, or experts or, or knowledge professionals in different spaces and invite them to come talk to us instead of us talking to ourselves. And I think that is part of that crossing these knowledge borders and cr crossing these different areas is, is identifying like, oh, that's an interesting perspective. Can we bring them in and, and hear from them? Whoever it is, wh like whatever their identifying characteristics are, like bring them in, have these conversations um, and just listen. Um, and then we can engage in different ways. I know that's, that's just one step. Um, another, and just to, to talk towards the chat, um, I, I think maybe we can start talking towards what other pillars or topics we want to address. I think there's a lot of good initiative and thoughts in our in our groups, but maybe creating a systems thinking working group, creating different working groups on different topics that people are interested in, I see that as a very important step to, to how we push forward as OGM as well. Um, yeah. Thanks, Phil. Um, um, let me let me make an observation and see if this resonates, uh, in particular for you, Scott. Uh, so, and Scott, you weren't on last Thursday's check-in call where uh, there was kind of a kerfuffle between me and Kevin Jones uh, because he said something and I picked up on a piece of what he said and he and I have history, we're dear, like he introduced me to my present wife. Uh, we, we go back a really long ways and he can be a little bit sharp elbow, elbowed sometimes. And he said something sort of, I went back and looked at the transcript. He said something twice that just kind of triggered me. So I jumped in and picked that up. But the rest of the story that he talked about was super interesting and was something I really wanted our group to talk about because he, on, on the Google group, which you probably saw, um, he had mentioned being at, a, at an event that included one of the two senators from uh, Mississippi um, who and, and describing the dynamics of trying to be at the edge and, and bring progress and yet needing to be in his community and represent. And, and it was super interesting, a conversation I'm dying to have. And so I picked up that thing and I went back in and he bashed on me later and said, we never talked about the thing I brought. And I'm like, I know it was partly because like, like that thing that you said that made, just made it impossible for me to hear you. Um, and, and I have a funny feeling, Scott, that of the 20 things I just put on the table, one of them was diversity. 
And you started our conversation down that path by stepping in and very nicely framing that for us. And we spent much of this call on that topic there. And I think on the mar uh, in the chat, you're saying, hey, there's all this other interesting stuff we could do to be of service to others. Why aren't we talking about that? Which I would love to do as well. But am I representing sort of, so I feel like there's a little parallelism here, a little, uh, the conversation just, we, we piled in on one thing, which is dis, which is sort of um, uh, uh, disturbing to some of us because like there's all this other stuff we'd love to actually talk about. And yet this thing is actually really, really important. So does that kind of represent the dynamic maybe? Um, I, I agree. I think it's very important, but it is part of what we do. And to maybe Phil's point, I think Phil was one of the people who had said this about, and, and maybe Mark as well, just let's doing, doing our work and, and letting that be the thing that we focus on instead of, you know, the, the hand wringing over, are we doing this right? Are we possibly offending anyone? Are we, let's, we know that that's not our intent. And so let's, let's, let's do our good work and let this be one fifth, one of the 15 items that we're always keeping in mind. But if we focus all of our time on that, we won't get the other stuff done. And it's, it's kind of a way of, of almost avoiding the real important work that we uniquely can do while we bring this along with us. Um, a brief comment before I pass the mic to Pete, which is I did a bunch of work with the EXO group in 2018, uh, Exponential Organizations, Salim Ismail. <clears throat> and the phrase that I would say in that group was, if you do the wrong thing exponentially well, you could really fuck up the world. And one of my beefs with the EXO methodology is that it has no moral compass. It really, like the process doesn't involve questioning about systemic anything. Uh, it, it doesn't really do that. It's like, hey, there's these really, really cool exponential technologies. You should use them for your project. Um, and we never did bake in any kind of sort of feedback loop or steering mechanism or, or ethical principles into the process, which is still kind of what it, what it was before. So I'm, I'm a little bit worried that if we don't pay attention to our assumptions and our point of view and the lack of other points of view here, that if we power ahead and just do like the, the rational thing to do that we're in fact maybe not being that helpful. Uh, so I am, I'm, a, I'm a bit of concerned about that. Pete? Um, uh, thanks all. I, um, so I'm, I'm sad that we ended up talking about this topic, um, but I also think it's a really important topic. Um, uh, uh, for, for me, looking, looking at the room and, and seeing diversity, um, like I said, diversity trailing indicator, it's it's bean counting. You've you've already failed when you're counting. Um, for me, it's uh, it's a symptom um, in the same way that uh, when you have a fever, it's a symptom um, in the same way that when you have high blood pressure, it's a symptom. Um, so maybe your high blood pressure doesn't mean anything. Maybe your number compared to somebody else's number, yours is is normal and there is and theirs, even though it's in a more normal range, is less than normal, and they've got some problem, right? It's a symptom. Um, it's it's not. So I guess the other thing is, uh, I think we all know that symptomatic treatment is probably not the thing that you want to do, right? Um, sometimes, I guess, maybe maybe you do want to just make sure there are enough women in the room. Make, maybe you just want to make sure that you take a drug that lowers your temperature, but. If you keep doing that, if you keep masking a symptom, or worse, ignore a symptom, you know, there's I so I can tell from me personally, this group is has a fever, a, a pretty bad fever, um, and you know that doesn't mean that we can't keep working. It doesn't mean that we won't be productive. It doesn't mean that we'll continually choose the wrong goals, but. I can also tell that we're sick and I can also tell that we have habitually not been able to get ourselves to be better. So that's kind of where I find myself. Um, and I have to say, um, and I apologize for this. I'm being, I feel like I'm being a coward. I, this, this whole diversity thing, it's not actually my fight. I don't care to win it very much. Um, 
uh, I just, I'm, I'm, you know, I have, I have two feet. I have to like move away from these, these, these discussions where it's all white guys, you know, and it's not, I'm not trying to make a statement. I'm not trying to say that we should be more diverse. Me personally, I love each of you to the extent that I know you and some of my, some of you I know really well. It's, it's just like, you know, why would I go to a place where we're all being sick together? You know, why would I enable that? Why would I, why would I do that? And I get, I get that there are times when you have to man up. Um, there are times when you have to like be brave, uh, like women are brave and say, you know, I'm going to go do something that I don't want to be doing. And that's why I've been sitting here for this hour, I guess, um, because I, this is a problem that needs to get fixed. I don't, I, you know, I've got other, I've got other stuff in my life that's more important to do. I can't come to a call. I can't come to this call again if we're, you know, if we're like this, I just can't. And it's not me saying, oh my God, follow me, it's a movement. Oh my God, you all, you all suck. Oh, oh my God, I suck. Oh my God, I've got some identity issue. It's just like not, you know, not interesting. It's not productive, it's not generative. We're not being generative right now in the way that I feel like we should be generative. And so, you know, let's, let's stop doing it that way. Um, Pete, totally respect what you said and understand if you, don't want to be in a group that shows up like this. Um, what Michael just typed into the chat represents a lot my own understanding of how to get over this issue and the and getting over it is not an easy quick solve. Um, I'm really interested in being of service to other organizations that are not like us. That I think that's a really quick path to, to, to fixing the problem, but it won't fix the problem right away because because A, I don't know what to offer other entities and I need to have this conversation about what the hell is OGM. I need the rest of what's on the table here to be solved so I know what to offer other organizations. And so I know that there are other OGM members who would like to do perform those things and do those things for to be of service, like not to invite in here because inviting in here is fraught, is like, well, whatever, like, like I, I'm not looking to recruit membership for people to show up here, which means from, to me, the diversity of population of these calls is a lagging indicator of success on actually figuring this out and being of service. And so I don't know what to offer anybody. So I need the rest of this question kind of, kind of solved in order to do that. And if that means that it's a bunch of white guys trying to fix it for a while, so be it. At least like, let's make progress on it and let's go be of service. Um, and if that means that people don't want or can't participate because it's too many white guys, I completely understand. It makes total sense to me. And, and, and I apologize. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how do we actually turbocharge what we've got, uh, make some sense out of it and bring it to other people. And, and while we're busy being of service to other people, we will be in their conversations and our conversations ought to be thinned out. Like, like we will be in other sorts of places. And if we're fortunate and if the sharing of DNA, if the swapping of spit with other organizations works, then some of them, many of them might come over and mingle with us and say, we love what you're, you know, I'll have what you're having because this is really productive and this is working really well. And then suddenly, and, and then suddenly later, we'll not be worrying about this because it will have shown up. Um, Mark Antoine, thank you. Um, uh, Phil, go ahead. Oh, you were waving to Mark Antoine. Sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was just saying goodbye. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so does that make sense? Pete, is that okay with you? Does, um, that, make, does that make sense to you? It, it makes sense to me. By, by definition, it's okay with me. I, the, I, I think... It, it feels to me... And... And I, I don't mean to be prescriptive or, you know, I, I don't mean to, because you asked. Um, it feels to me like being, um, it feels like avoidance, you know, to say I, I have to meet here to figure out what I can go talk to other people about. Um, so I, a, a different way to do it would be to find, uh, find a new friend who's a woman or find a new friend who's Bach or find a friend who's black and a woman and say, and, and just talk, right? Listen to her a lot and talk a little bit and ask some questions. And, you know, maybe the, it, it's, it's, it's easy to, it, it's easy to put off, you know, things. It's easy to say, 
well, I, I don't know how to solve that. And so I'm just going to kind of keep doing what I'm doing and maybe it'll, it'll get solved or maybe that doing that will, will, will solve it. Um, a, 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 other, a, a different approach is to go, let me stop doing that um, in, in more of a closed space and go out to talk and go out to talk in, with other people and ask questions about them and ask, you know, how should I do this? What would we do together? So I, so I think I can, I can walk to another group and represent what I think, what I dream OGM is and could be and make it up. And, and what I started this call with my brain sort of enthusiasm and all that kind of stuff was that was the picture of that, that I was trying to paint in an impressionistic kind of way with, with quick brush strokes. And I'm happy to lather, rinse, repeat in other groups, but I don't know that anybody else feels the same way about OGM or would represent that way. And I'd love for many of us to be doing that. And I'd love to know that when I represent in that weird impressionist painting, that it roughly accords to what other OGMers actually think we're doing, uh, as opposed to somebody thinking that we're a Dali or we're a Pollock or we're something else. And I'm just trying to have that conversation. Maybe there's a, a conversation or several conversations before that. You know, what kinds of things, here, here's something that I'm interested in. Tell me something you're interested in. You know, here's a couple more things I'm interested in. Tell me a, a couple more things that you're interested in. You mean with diverse people or you mean among us? Um, uh, because I, I feel like we have a, a, a strong indicator that we're not culturally diverse and not power diverse. Um, I, a lot of those conversations, so, you know, a, a lot of those conversations, and because I guess because OGM is going to try to solve problems of power and problems of culture, um, the early questions and the small conversations, I don't think I would go to a diverse group and, and give them a whole vision. What I would do is go to a, a one or two people who are different than me and you know, here's something I'm interested in. Can you tell me something you're interested in? Start I'm, I'm, I'm in a bunch of the, I'm in a bunch of those conversations and I'd like to That's figure great. out how to click this thing together. Yep. Yep. Thanks Pete. Um, Phil? Um, I would just, um, uh, just to, to move things forward, but I, I would just put out a kind of call to everyone that it might be good for even us to share kind of events that might be good to join. We can create a running list of events of, of people we'd like to reach out to. And I, I call, I, I'm, so I've started working in a staff capacity uh, with OGM. So if there's people you'd like us to reach out to as OGM, feel free to share. You, I'm on Mattermost, or you can you can reach out via email. Um, but we can start putting together a list of people to reach out to, events to join. Um, and that, I'm not saying that'll be a solve for this at all, but it's a step. Um, sorry, Pete. That's all right. Thanks, Phil. Don't be sorry. Um, Pete? Um, it, it reminds me, I think, uh, because you all look like me, I think you've, you've had the same experience as me. Um, I've spent like, you know, like 10 or 15 years reading about how to be an ally and, and, and a lot of it's actually just been reading, but there's, there are good resources for, you know, and a lot of the typical kinds of questions that white guys ask, you know, um, uh, you know, there are writ answers written down for them. Um, uh, so, uh, so I, I will try to put together, you know, some of the resources that have helped me like think as an ally rather than thinking as, you know, the, the, a guy on a high pedestal going, why isn't anybody, <laughs> you know, hanging out with me? Um, agreed. And I just put my collection of resources on that here. And what I'm a piece of what I'm trying to do is figure out how can OGM be a good ally? Um, so that we have a, a good taste in our mouths at the end of this call uh, that this might be a fruitful endeavor towards the question that I started with, can we like step aside and back into the general um, problem of what would OGM do? And I'd love to hear anybody sort of who'd like to contribute to that. Uh, Tony Marcados here. Just these are my thoughts and it's just how I interpret things. I got my retired engineer. so. That's the, I see from what I hear, the t addressing tough problems is the purpose of OGM, or that's what everybody wants to end. It's also what everybody else wants to do. And I think tough problems are solved by systems thinking. And I've been on, I've heard Derek Cabrera, Benjamin Taylor, a bunch of other very sharp people in the systems community saying, hey, 
systems thinking don't really exist in a unified form. It's just it's a bunch of disparate parts. To quote Derek Cabrera, we just can't keep telling people there's 2,842 different disparate concepts in systems thinking. It gets nobody anywhere. So I think a uh, first, uh, first thing to do would, uh, try, I think a unified approach, and I, I did that for a school project, I, the, the COVID shut it down, but it's relatively easy uh, for, for, for STEM volunteer. It's, I think it's relatively easy to come up with a unified set of principles for, for systems thinking. And that, that, that diagram that I presented on Matterboost presents part of it, by no means all of it, 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 it talks about the loops and, 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 and levels that it brings those two concepts together, multiple levels, multiple loops, and how do they all interrelate? The loops we see at 50,000 feet are entirely different than we see at ground level. Well, causal loop diagrams are single level. There's a disync there. There's something that needs to be brought together. And that uh, diagram I have is, is, is an attempt to do that. It could be expanded upon, but there's, there's a ton of things that, uh, that, that can be done the, the maybe uh, a project that actually do something and then move on to bigger projects. If we come up with something that works, we could uh, apply it to bigger problems. But the first step is to come up with some a workable prototype and then move on to, to other things. Right now, I don't see, and if anybody's got anything different from what I've heard and seen, there's, there, there's no way of addressing big complex problems. There really isn't. Um, so let me, let me answer you and then pass it to Scott. Um, so Anthony, I think we've created a Mattermost channel for this discussion, for, for systems thinking, and I would love to sort of collect this conversation there, and I would love for there to be a body of work, uh, assets in massive, in the, in the OGM wiki, for example, that relate to systems thinking and an effort to unify systems thinkers and system thinking models and so forth, and I collect useful thinking frameworks and all of that, and, and I'll say that I was weaned into this world by Russell Acuff, one of the originators of systems thinking. I was lucky enough to bump into him in grad school in my second year at Wharton. I took a ser several courses from him and other people and it, like uh, that blew my head open uh, way too many years ago, I'm afraid to say. Um, and, then, and then he hired me to be his like feet on the ground in Argentina for seven weeks for a tiny project right after, at the end of school, et cetera, et cetera. So I like, that was my intro to systems thinking. And every, and I've talked to many a systems thinker and OGM, not surprisingly, attracts a lot of systems thinkers. We have many of them, a lot like, like Neil Davidson is a systems thinker, you, Scott, uh, George Silverman, uh, a bunch of other systems thinkers. And I have yet to find unifying uh, ways of thinking, Christina Bowen and her use of Kumu, Gene Bellinger is a deep systems thinker. Like, like, I don't know that there's like a simple unified model of systems thinking. And my own idea is if we, if we leave a variety of these tools at hand and help people pick their system thinking, thinking family and like go for it, that might actually also create a lot of progress. I'm unclear that there's like the grand unified model of systems theory, but I'm very happy to host uh, or curate or help help collect that effort. Like, so if, if you want to, uh, so Tony, if you want to sort of uh, lead that effort in some way, let's build something around you and let's figure out how OGM works so we know where that is and what's going on around it uh, and move forward with that. And now I have Scott, Phil, Shimon. Um, I guess positive side for the systems thinking, I just completed my certification um, with Cabrera Research Lab, actually. So I'm kind of behind the scenes on some of that. And they are just about to publish a new book with a man named Gerald Midgley, who had initially thought the Cabrera's uh, theory was bunk and has since come around to say, I think you might be right. I think that your theory is actually fundamental and is the unifying part of systems thinking. I'll just leave that out there. It's, it, it, it'll be out within months from what I understand. But um, what I wanted to say was that one of the things I, you, Jerry, I think you had said, what can we do? What can we actually do? What can we bring to the world? Um, I was having a conversation with my oldest son and I realized that a role that is not in any corporation I've ever been in, at least in a formal way, is that of senior listener. So you know the people you can go sit in their office and throw out ideas and, and they will 
they don't have their own agenda. They're going to help you talk through the problem and, and figure out what it is, you know, find your own thing through, through conversation. And one of the things I've realized in being in other Zoom calls is that this group, largely because of your, your leadership, Jerry, and then the way that, that Pete has come in to help, you know, balance that out with other, how do we have a meeting? How do we get together and, and talk? And it's really remarkable how well this group does that, even when we have our issues. And I've been in other groups just as a comparison and have just thought, well, this is a mess. It's just, it doesn't feel open. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like, you know, two people get to talk and then there's all the rest of the people who don't. And I feel like that is something of great value I don't know how to export it, but it feels like some of the things that uh, Michael had said about showing up in other groups, you know, you can, you can help guide that. You can help kind of be that model. And that, that to me, how to listen, how to have a conversation, how to structure a group of, you know, of 20 people, you know, especially in the 30, on the Thursday calls, it's the same thing where you're able to consistently have a process that we kind of follow that doesn't feel as rigid as Robert's rules of order, but it doesn't feel like, you know, two people watching other, or a whole group of people watching other people, two, two people talk. So anyway, I think that's, that's one of our areas that I think should, how do we, how do we make that into something we can export and say, here's how you do this. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I pass the floor to the distinguished gentleman from uh, Waldvogel. Well, it's uh, nice to be part of this call. I mean, I resonated a little bit with the diversity issue as a two week now retired psychiatrist in a huge healthcare system that just went through trying to understand diversity and power and things of that kind. I certainly appreciate this kind of smaller conversation along these lines. Uh, I came to know of OGM actually through Kumo and through Gene Bollinger and then reaching out to Jerry and actually found my few interaction with the group very interesting. I never think of myself as a systems thinker. I think more as a psychiatrist trying to understand complexity and how people formulate the lens through which they look at the world. And certainly if you don't look at the various uh, layers and various influences people have to deal with, you're not gonna really be able to help them. One of the things that I've been working on for a while is really trying to create a framework for having conversations. And in this way, I found that the way medicine looks at complex problems through a case presentation, through a framework, like a business plan, like what uh, legal professionals do with the Brandeis brief has been very helpful for me because it just enables me and people I interact with to really identify what some of the problems they're trying to solve, the vision that they have, for where they want to so like reach and then figure out what are the assets they have, what are the challenges they have and things of that kind. To that end, I think that what I've tried to do is create a toolbox for people to really engage with this kind of treatment plan. And one of the areas people mentioned working on a project I've actually come pretty far along with a project about the opiate epidemic. Now, why the opiate epidemic? Because it really involves system thinking on so many different levels and so many different people, whether you're rich or poor, whatever racial background, you've been touched by that. It's also the government has really failed in many ways to do what it's supposed to do. So I've really been shaping some of the format to think about systems, tools, how to engage people, how to empower them in interacting within their ecosystem around the issue of the opiate epidemic. I have reached out to a number of people, and this is how I have found 
Again, I don't think of myself as a member, whatever that is, of OGM, but what I've found very helpful for myself is reaching out to various people, including Lauren, Neil, Jean, Peter, not Pete, Peter, and they've provided great, just a one-to-one -one conversation. Uh, I have many people that I've connected with of various racial backgrounds, and they seem interested in a framework to address whatever problem that they are dealing with. In Philadelphia, beyond the opiate epidemic, a lot of the inner city issues, education, things of that kind, really lend themselves to that kind of thinking. So that's my two cents. I'm not sure that that's a direction where, uh, you know, uh, uh, OGM is thinking about. Uh, clearly, one of the challenges that we have as a society is the lens through which people look at their reality, the media, I think coming to terms with ways for people to engage with the media in a healthier way would be an amazing project. So these are my two cents. If anyone's interested in the larger project, I'm certainly willing to share that. Mm -hmm. So Shimon, among the things that I was presenting that like what would OGM do was sort of curating wise solutions to the, to the world's issues <clears throat> and also making them more, more available, easier to use, easier to put to work right away and all that. So, so as you develop uh, your ideas, it, it feels to me like that would be like content that we could help curate and, and, and uh, put into the kinds of tools and platforms we're thinking about. Um, yeah, Shimon has sort of been thinking about this personally for a long time, and, and, you're, uh, and so there's, there's materials there. Uh, so I think that what, we, what, what we're busy trying to figure out is, okay, so how do we help you make your idea better? It's like, uh, there's a process called the Writer's Workshop, which is really nice. Uh, I, the, Dick Gabriel wrote a book about how to run a Writer's Workshop, and in the Writer's Workshop, you're trying to help the work be the most it can be. <clears throat> and the process of Writer's Workshopping puts the author outside the circle so that everybody's talking about the work and not the author, which means it doesn't become a personal attack on the author and like that everybody's focused on making the idea better. And so I think this connects also to Tony's question about systems and systems models and systems thinking, because there's a way that the systems modeling can interpret your ideas and your theories. And there might be a really interesting bridge there to model what you've written or created in systems models. That could be an interesting connection, right? Well, definitely. I mean, talking about writer's workshop, I recognize one of my biggest problems is writing. And actually, I joined Foster, which is sort of like a writer's collective, which does some of this kind of work. And my one of my goals is to get better as a writer and be more clear. Yeah, I mean, you know, two of the things that I would suggest that you consider is along with the opiate epidemic is COVID-19. I think thinking in terms of systems would be very helpful in that regard. Two avenues to do it within medicine as a discipline. Uh, we have what's called case conferences where everyone comes together, someone presents a problem and you look at it from you know, histology, pathology, pulmonology, you know, all the different things. And present it with the tools that people have. I actually have created that kind of a framework where at the end of the day, creating these case conferences, you come up with a case presentation. The opiate epidemic is a, for me a great example because right now we're going to something very similar including the FDA and then marketing by Big Pharma and things like that with the new approval of this Alzheimer's drug, which is going to be, you know, horrible in my mind as a geriatric psychiatrist in terms of the cost to the country. Again, this is U.S. oriented in terms of taking away from other opportunities because it does have unintended consequences. So how can we think about as citizens dealing from a complexity viewpoint at this point, how do we approach the approval of this particular drug? Being informed about what happened with the opiate epidemic is a really good tool to look at this other issue. So two things that I've done, again, one is the case presentation, and another one is what I'm developing is the issue of citizens commissions. 
So again, it's Citizens Commission is a process by which you invite citizens, give them tools, not necessary experts to really look at what is important to them. The one that I've gotten furthest along is with COVID-19 uh, because we have so much polarization around an issue that really there shouldn't be that much polarization about. So how do we really use systems thinking to deal with approaching COVID-19 related issues that make sense to you as an individual, in your community, in the nation, globally, things of that kind. I think it's a great case for systems thinking. So the case presentation, as well as thinking about citizen commissions are two vehicles to really push forward a complexity model. Um, thanks, Simone. And in a, in a wishful thinking OGM world five years down the road, we would be building useful models that lobbyists would be using to try to change the regulations around the pharma complex and around what you know the approval complex and other sorts of things. Like I think that if we were a high functioning entity ourselves, we would be a useful tool in fixing the larger systems that are broken uh, around these kinds of decisions because uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, there's a whole whole lot of work to be done. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah. I, I, there's some really great, great thoughts coming out of, um, of this conversation. I really like the idea of building this framework based on a regional or local issue and trying to build that into a framework that can be shared with other areas, other organizations, other people. I think that's something we're trying to do with food systems realignment. But just to, just to go back, it sounds like we have a project around uh, systems thinking. It sounds like we have a project around facilitating conversation and listening, which Jerry, we talked about a bit yesterday. Um, and it's, it sounds like we, we could have a really great uh, project around uh, some of Shimon, uh, Shimon's different work and projects um, around the opioid epidemic around uh, COVID-19. Um, the thing I'm curious about in terms of what would OGM do is how do we concretely support these efforts? Because what can we do? We, we, have a, we have a community of about 200. Can we activate people? Can we help facilitate conversations? Can we help provide a framework for, for what project success looks like? What, what needs are there? Like Tony, if, if you were going to outline what, and not to call on you, sorry, but, but if you were gonna outline what your project, what success would look like in your project and how OGM supported it, what would that look like? Uh, if it's a question to me, uh, I would just uh, show the, the essential concepts and most importantly, and what has not been done yet is how those concepts interrelate. Uh, properly systems thinking is thought of uh, causal loop diagrams and stock and flow diagrams. Well, Derek said it himself, causal loop diagram, I, I say it that causal loop diagrams hit, don't focus at all on goals unless you identify the goals like that first person, like the previous person was talking about your son. And unless you could tie it all together, you, you can't go forward. So uh, looking at how the current state of things that uh, how properly systems thinking is, is uh, interpreted versus the way it should be interpreted to consider things like goals or some of the things Derek Bear was talking about that there's no drill down of relationships on a causal loop diagram and you need drill down to handle complexity. I mean, there's a lot of conflicts here, just bringing those to light and presenting that I think would be a, would be a huge contribution just in of itself. So just to also to, to be like really practical about this, um, Pete has built a, a, a new uh, knowledge management holding platform called Massive. Massive Human Intelligence is a larger project. It's, it's like really, really OGM-y. And we've been using it to build an OGM wiki, which is kind of uh, uh, underneath a lot of the things we're trying to build up. Using it at this moment is not exactly simple because the documents are all kept on GitHub and you have to understand how GitHub works and you have to use markdown editors <clears throat> to do that and so forth. Uh, so there's a little bit of an on-ramp to figure out how to use it. But, but Tony, Shimon, others, it would be really interesting to build a body of work on OGM Wiki to represent some of these documents so that we had a place to go and a beginning of what these documents are. I'll then add to that, 
<clears throat> I like Cabrera's research. I, I've not taken the training. I don't know much about it. DSRP sounds like a fine and, 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 and a fine uh, starting point. They may have intellectual property issues with their stuff being put elsewhere. I don't know. My bias is in favor of people who really want wisdom generally dissipated, disseminated, and made useful. And we're going to occasionally bump into IP protections around ideas. So to what extent might we build out stuff on our wiki and our, in our online presence that does or doesn't conflict with or amplify or improve the work of places like Cabrera Research? And I'm, I'm very interested in that question because our ability to synthesize, uh, improve, uh, curate, make available, uh, with entities like this, figuring that relationship out to me is really, really, really important and is not on my list of things of what would OGM do. So uh, that, that's a lesson to me right now. It's like, okay, one of the things OGM needs to learn to do is to negotiate with entities like, let's say, Dave Snowden, who is really protective about SenseMaker. Like, how do we get SenseMaker broadly used in the world and still make Dave Snowden happy? Hacking that is really interesting to me, uh, as is everything that Shimon, you and Tony uh, just sort of put in, put in the group. And I know that Hank is working on positive cartography and Michael has a company that could be a platform for a lot of this stuff as well. And I'd love to know how to hack Factor to be part of the engine and part of the, 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 the holding mechanism for these ideas and the propagation mechanism and so forth. So that's a really complicated thing to end this call with. <clears throat> and I wanted to ask, uh, so for next Tuesday, I had proposed, let's move through this topic on to outreach. I think we're not anywhere near done with this topic. So maybe I just shift us forward a week and say, let's, let's start over on this topic again next week. Now that we've turned the soil a bit, um, let's each of us try to actually invite humans who aren't like us. Uh, Pete, if you don't want to show up, that's, I, that I, I will not, my feelings will not be hurt. I completely understand how you're coming at this. I am uncomfortable in meetings that where everybody looks like me and I'm trying to take sort of, unfortunately, the long road to fix that. Um, uh, but I'm, but I'm, but I believe you and I'm like, love, love how this, how this, like we're, might, what this might become, but we're not there yet. We've got a fever. Um, so, okay to replicate, sort of stay on this topic for next Tuesday. Let's each of us try to bring people in uh, at least, uh, you know, who are, who are not like us. Sound good? Okay, um, let's do that. And uh, credit, it, we love like pointing to who originated things, credit is awesome. Uh, and I think a big piece of the mechanism. So one of the big questions in the back of my head is how do businesses make a profit while nurturing the commons? Because typically businesses, capitalist businesses sequester the commons, natural resources. Like I have all the cobalt in the world so you can't get it or whatever. And in doing so, I get to make the most money because I now have a monopoly on cobalt or whatever. Um, so how do businesses still make a profit while nurturing the commons so that everybody can use all this stuff? And open source software is a beautiful example of that. And IBM is a great case study, which we don't have time to do right now. Um, but if we can figure that out generally to motivate more entities uh, to make more money because uh, as soon as we've explained this concept, we're like, and the people to go to, to figure this out and do it for your company are the Cabreras. Go knock on their door. They're right. In fact, they're in this conversation right now with us. And you've already gotten to know them because they're here is like the, the kind of the magic answer in, in some part. Uh, so how do we do that? And lather, rinse, repeat with the zillions of really great ideas that are out there. Cause I, I see many, many, many high functioning ideas trying to tackle the world's great crises. Uh, and rather than looking at the world as full of problems to fix uh, using appreciative inquiry to try to figure out what are the positive things we might do together. And here, Hank, I'm, I'm sort of pointing to you and like lead us into what positive cartography might do to help inspire, motivate, connect uh, all the rest of us along these things. So I don't know, I'm happy with where we are in a weird way. Um, and I'm really glad you uh, all joined this conversation. Any last, any last thoughts before we wrap this call? Yeah, let, let me just say something. Uh, I thought it was a fascinating conversation. It's also not my topic. And uh, I resonated a lot with what Pete said earlier. Uh, there's lots of stuff to do where you can spend your, your, your hours on. But I think this conversation took place because it had to take place. And uh, now I think we've gotten it out of the way and 
we can go on in future conversations to consider a number of the more interesting things like Jerry's list at the beginning and various things that were added to it during this conversation. So my thanks to everyone. And I'm going to post this video online as soon as the Zoom sends me the recording and all that, I'll get it back up and put it on the Build OGM channel. Um, uh, I might actually, if I have time, excerpt out the first part where I did the tour just to have that as a, as a little capsule to point to. Uh, and we can then repeat that, build it, uh, do it in other tools, like whatever. Like I would love at the end of these conversations to have a thing we can point to that says, this is roughly what we, what we are and how we work. And I will then carry that flag and I hope other people will carry that flag out as well uh, to figure out how to be of service to others. Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, real quick. Um, let me show you all the, the notes that... Um, Thank you. Uh, ...that um, uh, Phil and I have been taking. Uh, so uh, anybody, anybody can or anybody could have edited this during the meeting. Um, so, you know, we, we captured a bunch of the, you know, a bunch of the points, not all of them. Um, and I've started, uh, these are times uh, into the call. Uh, so there's awesome. a little bit of, of uh, work into it. Or, and or Peter, are you still, are you still running, um, are you still running uh, machine translation during calls or is that just something you're I, with? I have not for a while. Okay, good. Um, and then, you and were then, also you were also showing your notes during the call behind you on a like a, whatever. Are you are you thinking of doing that some more? Because that was lovely. Uh, that was with mm -hmm, uh, yeah. the uh, the oddly named uh, software tool. Um, I don't like using that because uh, it makes you know it, it slows down my computer, makes yeah, me laggy here. and look look dumb. Uh, uh, so this, uh, but but you know I. I, I think that's a cool thing. I, I like I like be having a thing behind me that. So these notes will end up in um, uh, in this wiki, uh, and this wiki is a little bit hard to navigate. Still, um, you have to know to. Uh, if the, my window was a little bit wider, these buttons would have been right here. But um, we've got meetings going back, you know, until uh, April or something like that. So um, there's there's a lot of stuff here. Um, it's it's so far it is not not very well attended uh we we haven't told people much about how to use this and okay. and um, uh, almost done uh okay. and you know how to, how to get more involved but that would be nice if people would sorry for not muting there um that sounds awesome and uh uh you'll put a link to the document in the ogm wiki once you've post pushed it to the wiki, so uh, it, it'll actually be it. it'll be the document itself. Uh, it's going to be a page in the wiki, um, and then I'll also take that markdown file, which is just a plain text file, basically, and uh, I'll I'll drop it or Phil will drop it into the um, the Mattermost channel as well. That that's that's what I was saying. That's what I meant. Um, super. That's perfect. Um, love that because one thing that OGM could do and isn't doing very much of is using our own the things we're talking about. We're not doing that very much. Uh, and the place where that's really intense is Pete's a fantastic note taking during meetings. So we have we have a lot of meeting notes from from previous notes, but we don't have a lot of like and I use my brain to annotate calls and then I post that and send a link to it. But we don't have enough of that going on with different tools and different perspectives. It would be lovely to have more of that. Um, and I'm going to have to read the chat after we're done. Uh, just to catch up with uh, all the good ideas that floated around here. Thank you for this call. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And bye for now.